Hi there, my name is Ray Pavlik. I'm the curator here at River Cleveland Aquarium. And today we're going to talk about different parenting strategies in the animal world here at Lake Aquarium. So for starters, we're going to talk about some of our native animals here in Ohio. This is our Ohio gallery. It's our native waters. It's the first gallery you see. And one of the first things we're going to talk about are our turtles. You can see we've got our red ear slaughter and our native turtles here. Just hanging out on the basking rocks doing their thing. They're actually egg-laying species in animals. So where a lot of people think about eggs as a bird thing, uh, which it very much is, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, turtles also are egg layers, uh, as are most reptiles. So there are a few exceptions to that rule, but the vast majority of them are egg layers. And what you'll have in turtles is after the breeding goes on, the female will go uh, up on shore somewhere and dig a little nest. And they'll dig that nest, they'll lay all their eggs, and they'll bury it in. And it's kind of a set it and forget it thing. Uh, the parents at that point usually take off and don't do any guarding in the nest. It's uh, best of luck to you. And the really interesting part is the temperature control concept at all. So within turtles, they'll have uh, different sex ratios, male or female, based on the temperature of the eggs. And you'll see this across the board with sea turtles, uh, freshwater turtles, and even terrestrial turtles, like our native box turtles. That's a really interesting way that they manipulate their genetics using temperature to fix their populations. All right, so now we're over in our tropical forest area, and specifically we're at our aviary, and we have our fruit doves we're gonna talk about right now. So if you look up in the trees there, we have a couple fruit doves, they have a male and a female. Um, they actually do a co-parenting strategy. After mating, they'll lay their eggs in their nest just like a normal bird does, but instead of just one parent or the other doing all the work on the nesting, they'll both take turns. So over the course of the gestation period, they'll each take turns sitting on the nest. You'll see both of them uh, flying around back and forth. That way they can still get food and uh, take turns and take breaks uh, with that activity. Now, an interesting point here at Greater Cleveland Aquarium is we're not actively trying to breed these animals, but they go through their natural behaviors anyhow. We can actually then pull their eggs and replace them with dummy ones that we had 3D printed to specifically match the proper shape, size, and weight. And they'll sit on those plastic dummy eggs for their normal term until they're basically done with it. And then we'll pull those off and they'll restart their cycle. So now we're over in our tropical forest zone. So the key feature in this are the surname toads, the paper pupas. Toads a little bit, bit of a misnamer. They're actually a frog type. But what's really interesting is their breeding behaviors. So you can see these guys, there's one here and there's one hanging out up here floating in the water. They're an ambush predator, but for mating, the females actually hold the eggs on their back. So most people are familiar with frogs. They release eggs in the water that make big clusters of frog spawn uh, eggs that hatch out through tadpoles. With these ones, as they go through the breeding process, the female takes in all the eggs on her back and they get a piggyback ride for the entire gestation period. And then at the very end, as the eggs have kind of developed, you can watch the tadpoles growing inside them, all these little baby froglets actually hatch out. Whereas most frog species, the tadpole is the stage of the hatches. These guys, they come out as fully formed little juvenile frogs. It's a fascinating thing. Um, it actually looks a little bit like a lotus blossom seed pod while they're on her back for a reference point. But we've got some other interesting parents. So we've got our uh, cichlids here. We've got our red-headed geophagus and we've got another species of geophagus here. They are a mouth brooding variety of fish. So in the fish world, there's lots of different ways that uh, parenting happens. And with these guys, they'll actually make a little nest. And once the eggs hatch out, all the little baby fry, the little tiny fish are there, they'll suck them up like a vacuum cleaner. And they'll keep them nice and safe inside their mouth. So periodically we'll have batches of these uh, fry in here. And you'll see the, the parents with these big kind of full cheeks. They're all kind of swollen up. Their lower jaws kind of extended down to make more room inside their mouth cavity. And then they'll, from time to time, release all the babies out so they can forage and the babies will find food on the, in the ground and in the rocks and grazing. And then if there's anything that threatens them, they'll gobble them all back up. And at first glance, it looks really horrifying, but it's actually a natural parenting behavior for these guys. It's a really fascinating way that they're able to give extra effort to their offspring to ensure a better viability and a better outcome. All right, so we've moved forward into our saltwater zones. We're in the sea tube right now, so this is our big underwater tunnel. Everyone's a big fan of it. It's one of the highlights of our visits here. And we're going to talk about some different types of live birth over on this side of the building. So we have our stingrays here, particularly our countos rays. They do a fair bit of breeding. We've got quite a few animals that have been born right here in Cleveland that are on site in our touch pool. So those are native stingrays, which sounds funny to say. 
but our stingrays actually give live birth. Countos give one pup per birth. It's a single every time. There's like one in 11,000 in the wild as a twin. Um, pretty rare event. So what happens with them is they actually have an inner uterine space. Uh, not quite the same as a mammalian uterus, but they do have uh, a form in there of milk. It's a nourishment, so instead of having a, a yolk sac or an egg sac for the stingrays, they actually uh, have this kind of goo in there inside the uterine lining that they can munch on the whole time while they're developing. And it takes about 10 to 11 months to gestate and uh, produce one offspring. So it's a lot of, a lot of work for the parent for the, the female there. She puts a lot of energy and a lot of effort into this one singular animal. So when we talk about different strategies for different breeding cycles, some animals put out hundreds and thousands of uh, offspring and little uh, fries and larvae and wish them the best of luck knowing that a lot of them are not gonna make it. These guys put in a ton of effort. You can see one up here, someone pious. They put in a ton of effort to making that sure that one offspring has a huge success rate. And so then, uh, once the time of the year comes, the females, depending on what zones they're in, where they're at in the, the, the ocean, they'll go into shallower shore areas, they'll give birth, let those pups kind of relax and, and settle in. And unfortunately then after that, they are on their own. So there's not, not a lot of aftercare like we had talked about with our cichlid friends over in the tropical gallery, but they put a lot of beforehand care into those pups.